On this week's edition of Silver Screen News, Snow White has gone Snow Woke. Yes, I said this, and we're going to talk about it. Mission Impossible disappoints at the box office, sort of. And we catch up with all the latest news from last week, including some dream superhero casting in Superman Legacy. And, of course, we go back 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years. Hashtag TBT, Throwback Thursday on Silver Screen News. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Silver Screen News movie podcast. This is the latest and gracious installment of our show where we, as two movie pundits, just recount all the latest news in the world of movies to give you our opinions and maybe inform you about some things you may have not uh, heard of, seen, or maybe give you an alternative opinion to your own. We must always remember movies are something where all opinions are welcome, all opinions are valid. Sometimes there's facts involved, and we try to kind of blur the line between both. My name's Nico Lero. I'm the one AJ, Anthony Jordan. And as always, guys, just a reminder before we get right into it, we have got timestamps for each individual story down below. So if you want to jump to a specific news story, uh, you can go and hit those timestamps down below. And just before we get into our first news topic, we do want to address the fact that, yes, we are aware that there is the writer's strike that is now in its 82nd, or I think by the time of this release is 85th day, we've got the actors who have now quote unquote joined in solidarity, but also for self-preservation, there are a million and one news outlets out there. There are a million and one news articles out there that are currently reporting on this multiple times daily. Um, we're not going to go into any detail on the Hollywood writers and actors strike. It's happening. It's freaking terrible. And people should be protected for, with their jobs against AI. And there's a million and one opinions about this out there. We're not touching this. We're going to talk about the sadly few news stories that are still circulating in the world of movies. So unless there's anything you want to add on it, AJ. No, listen, the, the key point is what you said. It's that it's not, it's sad to see that this is what's going on. And yeah, we support you guys. Like you guys have created entertainment for us and long may it rain, like long may it continue. So just be aware guys that this is all one show. It's like a week and any news we'll deliver will be well gone. So it's, it, it'd be pointless on us to bring out something that is ever progressing ever, every day, really. So that's the one. And we just hope for a positive result soon. That's, that's the best we can say. Yes, hopefully a positive result does come soon. But now we get into what is hot off the press, AJ. Yes, and what is hot off the press? Well, AJ, it's t Tuesday at the time of recording, Wednesday at the time of release, which means it's box office recap time. So... The big movie that obviously released last week was the new Mission Impossible movie. And continuing the current trend of recent big blockbuster disappointments, it disappoints sort of. There's a bit of, there's more nuance to this than just it's a flop. It's not that black and white. Let me just bring up the full story here. So here we go. Box office, Mission Impossible 7 falls short of expectations with a $56 million debut and collects $80 million domestically over five days. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 topped, box, uh, topped domestic box office charts while falling short of initial expectations. Tom Cruise's latest blockbuster collected $56.2 million between Friday and Sunday, a lackluster start for a movie that cost nearly $300 million before marketing. <laughs> Yes, I appreciate that makes for some bad reading. Heading into the weekend, Paramount and Skydance's action adventure was hoping to establish a new franchise record with 60 million or more. Instead, ticket sales landed behind 2018's Mission Impossible Fallout, which had 61 million, and 2000's Mission Impossible 2, which opened to 57.8 million, which remain as the top openings in the 27-year-old series. Comparisons aren't exact because Dead Reckoning Part 1 opened on Wednesday rather than Friday. The seventh installment has generated an estimated 80 million in its first five days of release, which is more than Fallout, 
and Mission Impossible 2, both of which made under 80 and in their first five days in theatres. But with a stellar 96% on Rotten Tomatoes and a glowing A grade cinema score, though, Dead Reckoning is likely to remain a force at the box office throughout the summer. But right now, it's pulling in, and this is bad reading, I appreciate, but right now, it's pulling in similar numbers to Disney's 300 million budgeted Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, which debuted to 60 million over the traditional weekend, over the traditional weekend, sorry, and pulled in 84 million through the five day 4th of July holiday frame. Indiana Jones 5, which doesn't have the benefits of great reviews or very positive audience scores, hasn't shown endurance. Ticket sales stand at 136 million domestically and 302 million worldwide. So it's as we reported, Indiana Jones 5 is a massive flop. To avoid a similar fate, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 needs to have a box office run as long and unwild and wieldly as the film's title. The movie which finds Cruz's Teflon operative Ethan Hunt defying death as he flies off a mountain on his motorcycle, scales a runaway train, and maneuvers a tiny car through a bustling streets of Rome was incredibly expensive due to COVID-related starts and stops and other pandemic-era safety measures. So there's a chance the next summer sequel, Dead Reckoning Part 2, also directed and co-written by Christopher McQuarrie, will be less expensive. Repeat business, as well as global box office returns, will be key in saving Cruz's latest mission. Although the seventh Mission Impossible is showing strength at the international box office with 155 million, even with its weak 25.4 million debut in China. That brings its worldwide tally to a respectable 235 million, the biggest global start for the franchise. And it goes on and on and on. So now we get to discuss our favorite thing, which is <laughs> thoughts. AJ, I want to I want to give you the, the floor here to start with. How do you view this in relation to Indiana Jones 5? Do, like, talk to me about your general impression that the world has towards Mission Impossible and what the numbers mean to you. Do you know the funny thing is that you you sit there and you hear it and the, the way you read the story, and I don't want to disrespect any news outlet that covers this, but it feels like a bit of a non-starter story to be like terrible box office weekend. But you then move on and be like, it didn't open on the weekend. It came out before and it's had a pretty strong five days based on that. Now, I'm not saying like, I understand the weekend is the weekend, but also day release means a lot. You know, you, you take something like Deadpool, it was put in the dead season in February and people went in masses to watch it. And it's yeah. the same here. It's it, it's positive to see that it's got a good review and people are still following the Mission Impossible franchise. I was actually really scared that it may not be something, you know, it, it looked like, yes, Top Gun gave people faith in cinema again, but it's declining. The fact that you're seeing it means, okay, it's not a strong box office weekend, but it just means people are still excited to go and see a film on release day, it's actually pretty good news as opposed to bad news. Yes, it's weekend, mm. but if you're released early and your first five days make it, it proves people will rush to the cinema irrelevant of the day because they want to see a film or franchise. So well done, Tom, for not only having Top Gun behind you, you're doing pretty well with uh, Mission Impossible as well. It's good news. Yes, there's expenses behind it as well. It looks like it's, you know, it could be, you could reduce the expense on the next film. And there are reasons behind why there was expenses. In comparison to um, Indiana Jones, you're always as good as your last movie. And, you know, the Crystal Skull just wasn't something people were running behind. And you are you have an aging star in it. Tom Cruise is also aging. I'm not denying that at all. But he's in a better position. People will follow him that bit more. He's still got that pizzazz. And the last one was awesome. Like, Mission Impossible is a fun franchise. It's what's mm -hmm. done next. As opposed to Indiana Jones of how many snakes is he going to say he hates? You know, and I love indie, but I'm just being real behind it. Yeah, there's, there's there's actually quite a lot to unpackage here for a few reasons. So, I mean, first first and foremost, this is my chance to do to do this face. Because it's my chance to say, I told you so. When the whole world has been like, Oppenheimer is going to open to 100 plus million. Mission Impossible is going to open to 100 plus million. Of course, I had to be the guy that people insulted online and said, it's not going to happen, not because the franchises aren't bad, but because historically they've never opened to those sort of numbers. Nolan movies never open to those sort of numbers. Mission Impossible doesn't open to those sort of numbers. And yet people believed otherwise. Well, here you go. The opening is not as strong as people believed. 
But I have to say that the biggest thing, and this is so key to, and comparing it to Top Gun Maverick, is it needs to stay in cinemas. The single biggest travesty going on in cinema in terms of the movies making money at the moment isn't necessarily the quality of the movies. There's, that's part of it for sure. But when we're talking about why are the movies which are universally being said, yeah, this is really, really good. Why are they not making more than they are? It's because of the 45 day cinema window. Like it used to be 90 days that, that a movie would stay in the cinema. Now it's 45. That's why you're seeing all these movies like, you know, the, the Doctor Strangers and all of the big MCU movies and the Star Wars, they're dropping on Disney Plus so soon. It's because of the silly 45 day window, which I reckon in the next 12 to 18 months is going to be gone anyway. And Top Gun broke that. The reason Top Gun Maverick made so much money is because it got released, re-released, and they kept it in the cinema beyond the 45-day window, and it made a bucket ton of money. If this movie is loved, and from the scores, it looks like it's already been really well received, it just needs to have time. It needs to have legs. Word of mouth will spread. People will say, oh, this new Mission Impossible is really good. It just needs time to be in the cinema. And uh, yeah, it, it's it's the biggest problem in cinema at the moment is this 45-day window. Um, anything anything you want to add to that? No, it's, do you know, it, more than anything, it's, it's the positivity that something that many people thought was on the decline is still standing strong. You know, if, it, if it's every other film or every third film, cinema is still got a bit of fight in it and that's what I'm happy with you know the semantics behind what and why hopefully it can be angled because they see the trends of what's going on people rushing back to see a film multiple times and you know despite you know going past that 45 day people still paying that extra buck to see it I mean I'll be honest and it's a sin that I still didn't see it I was quite happy at how long Mario was in the cinema I thought I was mm -hmm. missed it. and it was still there I just it just, the stars didn't align. That's that's the truth behind it. But it's good to see that that is the opportunity to catch a film. You know, it goes from the biggest screen to the smallest screen. That's fine. But just have that opportunity. Let it still make money. Let it die its own death as opposed to killing it while it's making its succession. And you know what's so funny about the fact that you've just mentioned Mario being in the cinema a long time? What's the highest grossing movie this year? Mario. Currently Mario. Currently Mario. Currently Mario that, could very easily be replaced by Barbie. I appreciate yeah, that. But yeah. currently Mario at 1.2 billion. This isn't random. It's not like, oh, Mario was the best. Mario is nowhere near the best movie of the year. But it had a long run time. It had a good marketing campaign and word of mouth spread. The, the stars aligned for that one. So yeah. listen, the, the cinema window is so important. But I want to hear what you guys have to say. Leave your thoughts and your comments down below. What did you think? What do you think of the new Mission Impossible movie? If you have seen it, are you planning on seeing it in the cinema? And why do you think that? Well, first off, do you think that it's underperformed given the franchise's box office history? We don't, but do do you what, what where do you see it ending up? Do you see it being a financial success? I think we both do, but leave your thoughts and your comments down below. And as always, please do like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Adrian, up next. <clears throat> uh, uh, how, how are you feeling this evening? Are you ready to put the big boy pants on with me? I'm always ready, bro. That's the thing about delivering news. You need to be ready at all times. This just, yeah. Let's 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 rem let's remind people. Why don't you remind people? Because we're going to talk about this this whole Snow White controversy now. Um, and it's two pronged. Um, it's with the lead actress and it's with the dwarves. And yes, it's Snow White and the seven effing dwarves. I'm not saying otherwise. Come at me. I don't care. Before we get into that, remind people if, if, if you don't remember, that's fine. But I'm pretty sure you will. Remember when The Little Mermaid came out and, you know, there was all that racial vitriol towards Haley Bailey, right? Halle Bailey. Halle, 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 yeah. Halle Bailey. And you gave a reason as to why she might not be white, like the original Disney portrayal, which actually turned out to be the case in the movie. So, <laughs> I was quite shocked by that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you called it perfectly. But, I mean, okay, I don't want to speak for you, but you basically said, hey, seven C's. 
Caribbean. <laughs> it would also best make sense. Crap, the flounder. The best like friend is, sounds quite Caribbean. You know what I mean? Like you broke it down quite wonderfully. But you also then followed up and saying, now there are examples where I think that we should not be doing ethnic changes. Snow White was one of the ones you mentioned. <laughs> now, I, I can't remember everything that I say along the way. Now, I don't know if you want this to be a, a, a vertical. I don't know if you want to read the story. And then I'll do it. There are two ways. Because essentially, am I opposed to certain things? Like, we are allowed to be diverse where diversity goes. I am the biggest Batman fan. I do not want to see a black man be Bruce Wayne. You can pass on the torch along the way, like you have Peter Parker and Miles Morales, two different people, two different stories. I do not believe James Bond should be black. It's just the way it is. You can give me the universe. Give me 0010 or 010. I don't care. He could be 001. He could be whoever. But don't make it James Bond because that's the legacy and the story. Why has this person suddenly changed? The only time it does make sense that you can have someone be the same and it changes is Doctor Who. Because I've not watched the TV show, but I'm aware that stuff bounces around and the, the spirit of the Doctor goes from body to body. Yeah, Doctor Who fans don't come at me if I've explained that wrong. It's the best I've understood from it. However, do I have an issue with... I mean, I've heard the announcement before and I'm yeah. going to say why I don't believe... Snow White should change, and the key behind hold that, hold is... that fire, hold that fire, because okay. I think I feel like this is this this will make a very good reel. So hold that <laughs> fire. Um, this story is two pronged because we have to deal with the casting of Snow White herself, and then we have to deal with the casting of the seven dwarves. Ha said it, dwarf, <gasps> dwarf. Um, Snow White and the seven dwarves come at me. Um, let's start with Snow White. Here's, here's, here's the story. <laughs> this, this genuinely makes me quite angry, but here we go. Not the casting, but the fact that this is, this hey, is story. happening. So Rachel Zegler refers to comments over her casting in Snow White as nonsensical discourse. The Latina actor, who is of Colombian and Polish heritage, and starred in Steven Spielberg's West Side Story remake, was referring to racist comments about her casting. This is from NBC News. Rachel Zegler is reacting to the latest criticism surrounding the cast of the upcoming Snow White live-action film. On July 14th, Daily Mail <laughs> published photos from the set of the remake, providing a first look of the diverse actors portraying the seven dwarfs from the Disney classic. Here's the first part which should annoy you, AJ. A Disney spokesperson released a statement to the Daily Beast that said, the photos are fake and not from our production. The Daily Beast said that later, a rep from Disney's quote-unquote PR shop confirmed that the images were real, but not official photos from the set. In other words, a paparazzi got in and snapped some photos and Disney were caught with their pants down. While some social media users criticized the casting choices for the Seven Dwarves, racist comments about Zegler, who is Latina, being selected as the beloved Disney princess, also resurfaced. Many fans supported the West Side Story actor online, calling her the perfect Snow White. Shut up. Just shush. Zegler expressed her gratitude to her fans, but she also said that she no longer wants to engage with the nonsensical discourse surrounding her playing Snow White. Good for her. The 22-year-old tweeted on July 15, extremely appreciative of the love I feel from those defending me online, but please don't tag me in the nonsensical discourse about my casting. Instead, Zegler wanted to embrace positivity and spread more accepting message. So, AJ. So before you go up, let's just, just pull up the picture one more time so everyone can see the, the young lady involved. There you go. Now, okay, cool. That I, I hope that's there for everyone to, to take a look at. And I will I'm gonna I will break down as much as you need me to right now. Shoot. Now I look at this picture, and that is one of the best pictures they could have found of the young lady for this role because she does look like someone who could pull off Snow White basically. Sure. However, I've also 
been aware of West Side Story, where she plays Maria, who is of Hispanic descent. So we know her Hispanic roots are very much deep rooted. And either way, I don't have a problem with that because I will accept the diversity of Ariel and it doesn't have to be key. However, however, for, I just happened to have watched Snow White recently and that's not the problem. It's more the story of Snow White that I read before because I do believe the name Snow White was because this girl's skin was as white as snow. Her lips was as red as the blood from the film. So like there are certain parts that you cannot be of a certain color. Like had they casted, had Halle, sorry, let me get that back correct. Had Halle Berry, been cast as Snow White, it would have made no sense because the whole purpose behind this is... Ali Bailey, you mean? I said Barry, didn't I? Yeah. yeah. Either one, doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> right, either Halle. Neither of them have the skin as white as snow. Now, the same is going for Rachel. Like, this is a pretty good picture that she has the features. Don't get me wrong. She's a wonderful mm -hmm. looking lady. I am not dissing her in any way, shape or form. I can see the hair up. I can picture her in the cosplay. But... Let's let's play the game where we have to play the game. When certain roles are designated and everyone's like, it's unfair that X plays this role because it's meant for this classification. This is meant for Y classification. Let's play it that white people are still allowed to play white people, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's the real, you can't have just one side of the coin. So am I opposed? She looks the part, but if, you have to overdo the makeup on a Latina to make her look white as snow, then maybe we should have gone down the Emma Stone route. Do you get where I'm going? Yeah. I'm just being fair where fair needs to be played. I don't I look at the picture. I'm there. I've I Googled the name as well. And I saw Zelina Vega for any wrestling fan. I saw mm. someone of a very Latina descent and it's not, it's not a diss. I'm sure she can knock the role out of the park. But if we are going to say, roles designated for people of the, what have you had it not been for that key line that the girl is called snow white because her skin is white as snow people i have no problem tomorrow if sleeping beauty happens to be black there is nothing that tells me aurora has to be anyone else correct snow white <laughs> snow white it's in the name and again for anyone who wants to come up my boy for the fact that the film is called snow white and the seven dwarves if he called them dwarves, it's the role they're playing. He didn't call them Oompa Loompas for the fun of it. No, he called them dwarves because that's the title of the film. I rest my case. Yeah. Uh, as, uh, you know, as, as always, you've said things very well here. Um, this story feels all over the place to me because she's Colombian, but she's also Polish. So you're going to have people now defending it on that ground. She's not wanting to be tagged with all the racial vitriol, which I fully support her for. Why the hell she's being attacked is beyond me. Because it's, as I said to you off air before, it's like, hello, young 22-year-old, very talented girl who's worked with Steven Spielberg. Would you like to play an iconic Disney princess, one of the most famous potential Disney princesses ever, and have millions and millions of dollars reversed into your garden? Yes or no? Yes, please. But you may suffer some racial hatred as a result. Take the money and run, girl. Like, people shouldn't be attacking her if they have an issue with the casting. And as AJ said, I do have an issue with the casting. Not because of her, but because if the shoe was on the other foot, oh my word, the congressional hearing. Let's make Chad... Let, uh, <laughs> let's recast Black Panther as a white guy. Booyah, come at me. And the fact of the matter is, is that she isn't the one who should be attacked for this. If you have a problem with this casting, which I personally do, Disney are the ones that should be held accountable here. Not some poor actress who's not deserving of any hatred towards her because someone said, here's millions of dollars to play a role. Would you like to work? Let the girl work, man. You wanted to add something. I mean, two sides. There was a point that Letitia Wright was nearly cancelled. There is no way, after she was going to be cancelled, you could say Margot Robbie is taking over the role of Shuri. It would have caused the biggest outcry ever. Fact. You know, that's that. And I'm just going to follow up on your thing. 
like I can understand not being happy based on your own personal belief systems. As I said, someone who's called Snow White should probably be white. However, in that, I'm not going to tweet racial slurs towards the person. Mm. Leave her alone. Racial based on a, a certain belief of something that is embedded in race, but not necessarily racial. You need to separate being a racist from having a belief based on racial background, on background. Yep. Do you, you get what I'm saying? That you can't say you don't deserve the role. As you said, talented, but you believe it should be that, which I go back to. If there are designated roles, designated roles be the case. Don't attack someone because of that. Now you're proven to be a racist because you're attacking someone. Yeah, exactly. You don't deserve the role. That's where you're not. To tell someone they don't deserve the role, you shouldn't have taken the role. Now you're a racist. I believe it should have gone to someone else. It's very different. Very different. Mm. It is very different. Um, let's let's go, let's go. Doubly do here. It, I don't have much more to add to this. I think we we've said what we have to say on this. It's that. Do we agree with the casting choice? No. Do we think that the girl should be attacked? No. I would add. I think it speaks volumes that when these photos came out, Disney denied them. I mean, you want to talk about like, oh my word. Could I mean that shouldn't have happened? They should have just, they should have just done what Ryan Reynolds did when the when the Wolverine photos were about to leak and make the decision is that no no we'll leak them. It's going to be on our terms. You know so, Disney got okay. caught with their pants down, and it, it, even that sounds dramatic. Caught with their pants down, but it's like these photos came out, and instead of just being like, "Yep, those are the photos," and what, and standing by their guns, they started by denying it. To me, that just stinks of shame. So can I just ask a question while we're mm. on this topic? Mm. Um, I don't know if you want to make me long ways. Um, actually, keep it this way. We, we, I don't even mind making a box of this for you. Are you actually telling me that just because the filming location hasn't been confirmed by the source and that people are denying it, it doesn't mean it, it, there's still a chance it can still be true? Just, just, just the question that I wanted to ask. <laughs> To our to our friendly TikTok troll, <laughs> it, 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 it's just a question that it could be real, but the sources <laughs> deny it, and you didn't hear the filming location, so you still believe that it's just a question, just a question. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we move on. Okay, so I want to hear what you guys have to say. So, where do you stand on this casting? Um, do you agree that the girl should be left alone or do you agree that she or do you think she should be held accountable for accepting the role um I, listen think what you want whatever you do think i want to hear it down in the comments below so let us know let let the debate ensue but down in the comments play nicely no nasty racialness and please as always to be sure to like and subscribe if you can i be watched. honest can i be honest if you feel that that is the way you want to express yourself, expose yourself. It's not that we agree with you, but mm. if that is your mentality, let it be seen. And just, you know, I know you reply to comments more than I do, so it's a bit unfair for me to say that. But if that's the kind of nature of person you are, feel free to express yourself. I feel like the shame lies on you if you have a racial slur to put behind it. I leave it. No, it does. And, and well, look, we, we, we move on to... Um... We continue with the Snow White story as our last hot off the news. <laughs> we're, we're giving some chunks to the news this week, huh? So we've we've got our next part of this, which is we you know we've we we've discussed Snow White. Now we need to discuss the Seven Dwarves. Um, so let me bring this up because again, none of this can be done calmly either. Um, as in, people are very angry, AJ. From Screen Geek, Snow White set photos spark backlash for being woke, which they are. New photos from the set of Disney's live action remake of Snow White have sparked backlash from fans saying that it's too woke. Disney recently began production on their latest live action remake, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Now that set photos for the Snow White adaptation have leaked, however, the production is facing backlash for being woke. Hollywood has been doing their best to increase diversity in new film and television projects. This is a good thing. The diversity in Snow White, however, seems to be receiving backlash on social media due to, due to the titular character being played by a Hispanic woman. And now we get to the crux of it. 
Additionally, the dwarves are also depicted with different races, genders, and heights. Here, AJ, are the various images which surfaced from the film's production via Daily Mail. Please cast your eyes to the right to see the seven dwarves. Now, a Disney spokesperson is also said to have claimed the images were fake. They later clarified the statement, however, expressing that while the images were indeed from the production, they were not official photos released by Disney, which has zero bearing on their reality. Their initial statement is now believed to, to have been a mere misunderstanding. Oh, yeah, of course it was. It's also worth noting that the Snow White character featured in the picture is actually a stand-in for Hispanic actress Rachel Zegler. As for the other characters, they replaced the original quote-unquote seven dwarves as the film's quote-unquote magical creatures. The phrase dwarf was considered to be a reinforcement of a negative stereotype following comments made by actor Peter Dinklage. Thus, Disney plans to make some very interesting changes for this film as the newly shared images reveal. Fans have already responded with some of the following comments when they complain that the Snow White film is too woke compared to the original. So they have one little person playing a dwarf to be more politically correct. So six other people didn't get the job or the check, and somehow this is more sensitive. Disney is a joke. Meet the cast of Disney's new woke Snow White film. Snow White is a Colombian now, and the seven dwarves look more like six normal-sized hipster pedos and one dwarf from Portland. Snow White no longer has skin white as snow. Absolutely ridiculous. I don't like that tweet, but hey-ho, it's Twitter. Disney strikes again. Snow White is Hispanic, and the seven dwarves include six full-grown adults. I mean, that's just factual. So that gives you some idea of the of the varying levels of vitriol that have appeared online. Um, if it's okay with you, AJ, I'd like to run with this one. Because huh? while I didn't have... I, I made my feelings that I didn't agree with the casting of Snow White, but bared no ill will towards, towards Rachel Zegler, because not her fault if someone wants to give her money to work. Good for her. Take the money and run, girl. This... I'm not going to get angry about it because, look, we've got a cost of living crisis. There's people who are homeless. There's people who can't afford to feed their families. In the grand scheme of the world, this is not something one should be getting angry about, right? But you, the way we've been told ever since Scarlett Johansson was playing a transgender character a few years ago, I think in 2015, maybe later, but I'm pretty, no, it was later, about 2018, maybe. Um, and you were, there was that huge backlash about how it should be transgender actors who play these transgender roles, about how we've been told, I would argue rightfully for the last 10 years, that there should be more opportunities for gay, real gay actors to play gay characters in movies. Sure, I'll get behind that. But you can't stop there. You can't. The, the, the opportunity for whether you want to call them vertically challenged little people, dwarves, I don't care. The point here isn't to damage with words. Let's not get bogged down on, oh, he's using the wrong terminology. The point of the matter is here is that of the seven dwarves, only one of them is actually a dwarf. The six other people, are, you, know, they're, 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 you know, they're varying heights, but they're not dwarves. These roles have gone to the wrong people. Factually, again, I bear no ill wills of the six people who have been cast. They're just collecting a paycheck. But for the fallacy to be like, let's put some women in there. Let's put some black people in there. It's like, I'm sorry. Let's first and foremost, before we even think about their gender and their skin color, let's focus on the fact that the d dwarf actors have got very, unfortunately, very, very limited opportunity to actually make a paycheck in Hollywood and in most of the movie world. I don't like that, but that's just the way it is. So now you're going to take away arguably the most iconic seven dwarf characters in cinema history. Arguably, not necessarily, but arguably. You're going to take that opportunity away from six people, because only one of them's a dwarf, so six people. And you've got to remember, it's probably more than six people, because you've got to think about the body doubles, the stunt doubles. So you could be talking... 14, 21, you could be talking way more people here than actually just, oh, it's just six people who missed out. And even if it was just six, that's still six people too many who have missed out on a role 
behind hiding behind this this blanket statement of progression when it's actually in my opinion regression regression of the highest degree what's your opinion i i pretty much mirror what you're going to say and look it's not for me to say peter dinklage is wrong by saying playing the seven dwarves is offensive right i'm not in that category to speak however I don't believe let me word this in a way to 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 get my point across because it can be it can be constructed very wrong in the right in the wrong context. If you are creating characters to humor, to make humor out of them because of their, 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 their situation, their stature, now it's wrong. Something that has been ingrained in life. The title of this film still remains the same from what I've heard in the way this 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 headline has said, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves remake. Yet we have six people who are not dwarves. So now it becomes mystical people. So it's called Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. The, the, the title needs to be correct to me, but that you're still not acknowledging. Now, you can still be very open in this, right? I, you've mentioned the, the, the wrestler Hornswoggle was in an interview there. Carl Pilkington has also mentioned something. The black guy, I don't know his name, from Bad Santa could have been in there. Like mm. you can still get variety. You can still I you can still find a lady to play one of the seven dwarfs. There are many options sure. available. There are people across the world, I'm sure, who could fit within that category and still be diverse. But let's keep to the root of what it was. And you know what I would hope from that, this is the hope I have from it, right? is by seeing the skill that these seven dwarves, and I'm saying it by the title, not attacking the people when I say this, these seven dwarves will forgive the performance of a lifetime that Hollywood says, I need you for X. The same way we had Tyrion Lannister. The same way he went on to then play, I can't remember the character, but he was in a film. Peter Dinklage was in a film as the main character and no one questioned what it was. It was one of those... French oh, um, Serrano de Bergerac. The Ber Bergerac. That was the film. Now, okay, they changed the, the reasons behind what Bergerac's insecurities were, but you've now seen, and no one questioned it. No one's like, oh, what's he doing playing that role? Let's open up the let's open up those avenues. Let's give seven people who do not have a chance to be recognized in this category a chance to be seen and then get further work. That's what this was about. You take Peter Dinklage. At Carl Pilkington, like everyone be like, oh, those are the go-tos. Add three or four more after that. What happens there? You've now given people opportunities. You have let your own in, essentially. That's the power behind that. It's the same way Winston Duke is now a name that people want to talk about, thanks to Black Panther. These are the ways you open the door for progression. You don't shut the door. And again, I, I don't want to be wrong because I've not heard Dinklage's full statement and say that like, to play the Seven Dwarves is offensive. I don't know the full thing. But if it's to play Seven Dwarves in the Seven Dwarves, that's not offensive in my opinion. That's opening avenues. If it's you're going to create characters to mimic, to, to mock dwarves, I've got your back 100%, Peter. 100%. I'm not down with that. This seems like the opportunity of a lifetime just saying i could be wrong but it feels that way but this is the thing it's that these you know we're not talking about you know child's fictional you know little ugly dwarf creature monsters living living in solitude and that are going to be mocked we're talking about seven in Love character, character seven diverse in character individuals all of which are heroes, all of which contribute to saving a princess. And for once, it's not the knight in shining armor. It's not the, the dragon slayer. It's not X, Y, and Z. It's people with a shorter stature who are there to help save the princess. Now, for me, this is absolute lunacy because there's nothing there's nothing that says these dwarves all have to be brothers or all have to be related. I think in the Brothers Grimm story, they say that they're from the same clan and it's never covered that they're all brothers in the Disney animation. They're just a family, but it never actually says they're brothers, they're related. You and me are brothers as far as I'm concerned. Oh, fast, you know and I mean? furious. fast and Furious. Fast and Furious yeah, I mean, family. You know what I mean? Everyone in there. It's like you've taken... There was nothing that could have stopped you casting 
women and black people or Asians or Hispanics or any minority, as long as you made sure that first and foremost, it was someone of the right stature to play the role because they don't get enough opportunity. You think black people and gay people don't get opportunity in Hollywood? Believe me, dwarves get even less opportunity. So the fact that you've taken this possibility away from six out of seven people I, in the name of progression, I think is an absolute joke. Absolute joke. Um, any, anything, anything you want to add to it? I have a question. And I don't want to be offensive in asking it. Oh, just say I, I have to I don't ask care at this point. Vein. I have to ask the question in the same vein. Are people happier that Hugh Grant is playing an Oompa Loompa and they have to reduce his size on screen than giving it to an opportunity to someone of a shorter stature? Are people happier that we've gone down the diverse route of seven dwarves who are now of varying heights as opposed to taking people of the stature that has been described within the title of the film. So strange, isn't it, how we all think that their people were backwards before, and yet the Oompa Loompas, back in the old Gene Wilder movie, which is 40, 50, 60 years old now, well, it was, I mean, obviously they didn't have the technology that we do now, but it was people of shorter stature being given that opportunity. Not someone crawling around on knees or pretending to be, you know, an Oompa Loompa or a dwarf. And now, and yet here we are now. Listen, I was pleasantly surprised when I saw Hugh Grant. It made me laugh. It made me chuckle in that trailer. And then, you know, within five minutes, I was thinking like, well, hang on, wait. Why are we CGIing it instead of giving it to someone of shorter stature? That's another role missed out on. There is know, a... it doesn't matter. This is the thing is that people pick what they're offended by. It's like, you know. It, oh, if I'm Hispanic and the Hispanic person is not getting the role, or if I'm white and the white person, look, literally, we were talking about it before. If I'm white and the white person is not getting the role, whatever, or you know, I'm 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 an SJW and I'm going to be offended for everyone, <laughs> like who, who knew, yeah. right? But no one really spares a thought for people who have got shorter stature because they are such a minority and so underrepresented in Hollywood, and yet here we are with the chance for them to be in a remake of one of the most celebrated animation films of all time. And they're not getting the opportunity. It, it, it's a joke to call this progressive. Oh, because black people are in it as progressive. Yeah. Nonsense. Yeah. But I, I say this with trepidation. I want to know what you all think. Comment down below and like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And with all that done, AJ, Whew. <laughs> we can talk a little bit about the news that happened last week in a section that we simply call News Update. Yes, yes. So as we went off air last week with the last edition of Silver Screen News, some stuff happened, as it always does, because we record on a Tuesday to release on a Wednesday, such as our life. Um, so let's cover some of those news stories from last week in no particular order. Wrong show, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> something that made me very happy, very, very happy. The, Dis the, the reinstated Disney CEO, good old Papa, Papa Bob, Papa Bob Iger, just admitted that those of us who think that the quality of the MCU films has dropped are correct. And those of us who think that it's down to the Disney Plus shows diluting the product are also correct. <laughs> Yay, Bob. In a rare turn, Iger seems to acknowledge that Disney Plus and its demands have negatively impacted the brand's content. So, Bob Iger signed a contract extension last night, which will see him lead the Walt Disney Company for a further two years through 2026. Part of, Iger's remit part of Iger's remit is going to involve turning around what is rapidly coming a sinking creative ship when it comes to the issue of Disney Plus and the negative effects felt due to the company overstretching itself while trying to generate content for its streaming service. For reference, Bob Iger is the one who oversaw the original purchase 
of the Star Wars brand by Disney. Love it or hate it, it was a huge business move. Bob Iger is the one who pushed for Pixar to be Oscar-worthy movies. Bob Iger is the one who oversaw the first three phases of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and then promptly retired onto an island with a lot of money. And that clown Bob Chapek took his place and has run it into the ground. Back to the story. Speaking to CNBC on Thursday, Iger admitted that the company would be slowing down good when it comes to making movies and TV series for its Marvel Studios and Lucasfilm franchises, coming at a time when the company seeks to cut costs when a wide slate of releases have massively underperformed at the worldwide box office. Good! Every Disney-backed film released this year has had disappointing returns in their opening weekends, and all with absolutely gargantuan budgets. Marvel films in particular have disappointed, going back into last year as well. Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, the 31st film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, saw the sharpest decline in ticket sales from weekend one to weekend two in franchise history. The film was also the second lowest reviewed film in the MCU. Among chief criticisms of the film were the visual effects, which appeared to be lower quality than those seen in the franchise previously. For a film set in an entirely fictitious setting, the quantum realm, this was particularly jarring. Reports had indicated that VFX staff had been split between the project and Black Panther Wakanda Forever, with Black Panther due to for release earlier. Priority was given to finishing that film CGI ahead of Quantum Mania by then MCU executive Victoria Alonso. According to the report, Alonzo in her role as president of physical and post-production, visual effects, and animation production was responsible for overseeing visual effects. However, due to the strain caused by the pandemic, her department faced significant resource constraints. Furthermore, with the surge of Marvel productions for both cinema and television, the output was subjected to criticism for failing to meet Marvel's customary standards. The follow-up to that film, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, performed much better critically and financially, garnering over $800 million worldwide from a $250 million budget, with praise going to the effects as well as the highly emotive story, which had been written years in advance. So again, most likely under Bob Iger, and not shoehorned into the multiverse saga narrative pushed by Marvel. Too many projects, too few workers. Prior to the pandemic, Marvel Studio released 23 feature films in cinemas over a period of 11 years before branching out into television. The television series produced by Marvel series produced by Marvel Studios carry similar budgets to feature films. Since the release of Disney Plus in 2020, nine films and nine television series have been produced. AJ, let me say that again: 23 films over 11 years. Nine films and nine TV shows over three years. This does not add up. This does not make sense. AJ, I have said for the longest time, Disney, and you've heard me say it, as my first in line of support, you've heard me say for the longest time, Disney Plus puts out mediocre products and it is being a burden to the MCU. People have disagreed. Big Papa Iger is preaching the same wind as me. Where do you stand on all of this? Look, you know, I, I've always said the prediction was after Endgame, I don't know who's going to care. And the problem is, is if you keep churning out stuff that isn't of an Endgame quality, you're going to have a... It was it, You had a hard enough challenge anyway. And if you're going to release substandard, it then makes it even harder of a challenge for you because people are rushing to it and just getting disappointed time and time again after the fact that they're in theories that doesn't have the influence that it should have had to be as strong as the films that its predecessors were is another thing. And I'm not going to be funny. Just the other day, we went through this reel of stuff that were delayed by Disney. You know, Deadpool's been pushed back. This has been pushed back. That's been pushed back. It doesn't hurt. You can't rush perfection, you know? If, if tomorrow I was going to cook you a gourmet meal and I took the chicken out while it was still pink, you're going to say to me, I'm not, I'm not going to eat that. Do the same with movies. Appreciate what it is. We, we had to wait for many things along the way. Between Infinity War and Endgame was films that we didn't want. We're like, can we just get to the Endgame? Like, I don't care about Ant-Man 2. Let it savor. Let it simmer. 
do what you need to do. And it's the same here. Yes, you want to knock out everything. Knock it all back. People will wait and you will get a better review and comeback from it if you give the people what they want by giving them quality. Don't just knock it out because it's Marvel Geeks and they'll take anything Marvel. Yeah, we did. And we got very frustrated with it. And that's the case. Like, it, it's pretty simple. Take time, give quality, get the feedback you deserve. Finally, the bub has come back to Disney. And it is a wonderful day that Bob Iger is, was back and that, that Bob Chapek was dismissed. It is wonderful that Bob Iger has the humility to recognize that what has happened at Marvel, not under his watch, I repeat, but has the humility and foresight to realize that what has happened under Marvel over the course of the last three years is by Marvel standards an absolute disaster. Law of diminishing returns, dilution of product, too many properties being put out, nine films and nine television shows in a period of three years is insanity and was always going to create a reduction in quality with the odd exception here and there, such as Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. And he's called it, and he's pulling the plug on all of these TV shows and movies being produced in such large numbers, which will hopefully, because he's a man who believes in giving power to creatives, give the brilliant, brilliant people like Kevin Feige a chance to right the ship and a chance to be like, okay, cool, I've got less than I need to worry about now. I can narrow down and focus on a wider story again. This is nothing but good news. Long may Bob Iger's return be fruitful, and long may he be saying intelligent things like this, unlike it's Bob Chapek, who thought that we should make more Disney Plus shows just because more is better, and we should reduce the number of movies we're putting in cinema and do things like put Pixar straight to streaming, which has done great for that brand, hasn't it? Knob. Anything you want to add, AJ? No, I mean, it, it's pretty much that. It's just take time. It, it, essentially, series are more than a film when it comes to breakdown. You had 23 films over 12 years, 18 products within three years. You could see the balance ain't right. It's a joke. That's it. Just, it's a just, joke. And it, it, it once again just shows a wider argument that streaming is not the answer to problems. Streaming only adds to problems. If you can use streaming to complement something you're doing, like they did with One Division, that was good. But then when it was like, oh, we did one the good thing, let's make eight. It's like, no, 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 no. Make for the sake of making is not, it, it, it's not going to make me want to watch it. It's no good. But the question is, what do you guys think? Leave your thoughts and your comments down below. As always, where do you stand on Bob Iger's comments? And are you hopeful now that he's going to limit the amount of content being made, that there's a bright future ahead for Phase 5 and 6 in the MCU? Um, yeah, like the video, share the video with anyone who you think may be interested, and please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Adre, it's that time. <laughs> it's that wonderful time. Where we take a walk with our sticks and zimmer frames and our creaky backs down the long dusty road that we call throwback thursday movies get your hashtags up hashtag tbt hashtag throwback thursday yes we're gonna go back 10 years 20 years and 30 years. These, these hurt me when they come up. These hurt me because some of my golden old, some of my all time favorites are golden oldies. And it's hard to admit it. It is what it is. Okay, well, bro. This, this week, all three of these are pretty near and dear to one of us, the other one of us, or both of us in some cases. Okay. This first one shocks me. It might shock you less because I think, well, I know you were later, the part, later to the party than I was. For me, this is crazy that it's already been 10 years. Arguably the greatest fran horror franchise of the modern day, part one, The Conjuring, AJ, is 10 years. <sighs> yeah, I, yeah, uh, that, that, it's a near and dear film to me, definitely. Mm. The impact of the age, I've seen it recently within the yep. last four years. So it's, 
it can't hit me as much kind of thing like sure. yeah if you told me i watched it 10 years ago i'd be like excuse me <laughs> no i didn't <laughs> but yeah um yeah it doesn't hit me as much because i didn't really pay attention to the time i was just like okay let me catch this film and really enjoyed it so yeah awesome awesome film it's the way horror should be done as far as i'm concerned yes um but yeah Mad. Awesome yeah. film, The Way Horror Should Be Done, from one of the modern masters of horror, James Wan. Um, I've seen all seven of the Conjuring universe movies universe. now. Yeah. Um, I, I think that they, they vary in quality. I, I would argue that Conjuring 1 and 2 really are absolute peak modern horror making. I, I appreciate that 1 is probably the better movie i have a preference for number two just because it spooked me personally so badly that bloody nun <laughs> god damn nun bloody valak but it valak valak the demon nun has become an icon of horror now like there's no two ways about it valak the demon nun although the name may not yet be as popular because it's you know we're still not that far removed 10 years I genuinely believe in 30, 40 years' time, Valak is going to belong in the same conversation as Freddy Krueger, as Michael Myers. Like, she's way more scary than any of those guys. Like, I, yeah, yeah. I, I messed with Freddy before I messed with Valak, I can assure you that much. Um, <laughs> apparently, I'm terrified of nuns. Who knew? But no, the, the, the movie is fantastic. It knows how to play on. It, it's aware of what horror stereotypes are and uses the audience's inbuilt knowledge of horror stereotypes to psychologically mess with its audience. In that when you think a jump scare is coming, James Wan knows that you think a jump scare is coming and doesn't deliver the jump scare. And that moment you're waiting for and you are made to keep waiting is what adds to the tension in this movie. It's like, well, you're going to make me jump now. Mm, wait, this doesn't feel right. Okay, it's going to be now stop messing with me and the whole movie messes with you psychologically which is why it is such a triumph i mean i still remember yesterday the conjuring 2 coming out you know literally walking out of fabric nightclub in london i think this was in 20 no it can't have been that long ago 2015 maybe so there was a bit of a gap between one and two but i remember being in london walking out of fabric nightclub having been on an all-night bender not being tired <laughs> and uh, deciding that I wanted to go and watch a movie. And I walked into The Conjuring 2, and Valak the Demon Nun proceeded to scar me literally for life. So this this franchise is is, is very near and dear to both of us. Nice. Um, 20 years old, AJ. Hit me. Dearer to you than it is to me, but still made me go, the flub? <laughs> what? Mm -hmm. It's number two, AJ, of... Bad boys, bad boys. Oh, you have got to know. Yes, boy. Bad boys, oh. too. This way, oh, this God. is all you, brother. <laughs> Run with it. It makes sense, but it doesn't. Like, yeah, I was deep in my, yeah, school days, just finishing school, just out of school. Oh, and yeah, Bad Boys had come back out, and yeah, Will was that guy at that time, and oh yeah, oh man, no, 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 no. I, I'm just, I'm just getting flashbacks at the minute of what I was doing and what was cool at the time, and yeah, my head's kind of braided at the moment. But that that boyfriend who comes to see Martin Lawrence's daughter, and then like playing him like this fake ludicrous and all of this and all of that, and it's <laughs> yeah. like here we are. 20 years later it doesn't make sense but it does at the same time i'll tell you what doesn't make sense two la police officers having both ferraris and houses that nice <laughs> that doesn't make any level of sense it, it, it's it's more than years of service but yeah we won't go there you know what i mean <laughs> 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 bad boy, <True>. bad boys. <laughs> yeah. What did you do? Anyway, that, that's a different really? story entirely. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a good point. That's a good point. Mind you, saying that I'm also aware that the cost of property is a lot different than the UK. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. I, I, listen, 
growing up, I preferred this one. But in my adult years, I definitely think Bad Boys 1 is the better film. Bad but Boys Bad 1 Boys... has a better story. Way you better just story. get more fun out of Bad Boys 2. Bad Boys 2, the, the, the freeway chase scene down... Well, the freeway chase scene, but the chase scene down by the water on the... On, it's awesome. It's awesome. As much as I dislike Michael Bay, that chase is... It's quite something. Do you know what that also means? We are 20 years into the birth of Usa. Usa. Yeah, boy. <laughs> That's even crazier because that has become like that. Cool. Pal driving a mama rat. They do it just like us. <laughs> yeah. Usa. That's bad. Because that, that is like a pop cultural reference now. People say it without even necessarily knowing it's bad boys too. Yeah, wow, it's true. Wow, it's very true. Thirty years old. All right, man. Thirty years old. I wonder if you've seen this. It was, it was one of those like, not com- what kind of coming of age, but young, very young tween adult movie that seemed to be you know with the Home Alones and all of those very very of its day, and it feels thirty years old, but it still makes me go, boy, I'm old. Because 30 years old, AJ, is Free Willy. Of course I've seen Free Willy, man. Come on. Good. Good, good, yeah. good. Oh, my days. Yeah. Oh, my days. Now, talking about the fact that I've, of course, I've seen Free Willy, this was actually shown to us in school. You know, no, no kidding. That room, yeah, that room that had the huge projector screen, literally its own mini cinema. I remember seeing it in there. And, yeah. My God, I've seen Free Willy more than once, but it's been a while yeah. since I've seen Free Willy at the same time. You know, and that, I mean, that the poster says it all. It's that epic jump for freedom for, for, for Willy, you know? Um, it's, that was the, it was, the, it was the thing that you saw in the advert and you couldn't wait to see it in the film. Um, the film is a lot deeper than that, you know? It's, mm. it's literally giving an animal its freedom, which is, you know. It's giving an animal its freedom. It's about unlikely the most unlikely friendships you know and the fact that this young boy who's jesse who's being adopted lost his parents obviously he's an orphan um and you know willie the 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 whale um been separated from his parents so they've got this commonality and the movie tries to get you to buy into the fact that okay they, they, they are two kindred spirits and this is how they find each other i i personally always like the native american um element that they added to it you know that one of the you know the guy who trained jesse to to interact with willie was native american and explained how they used to be whale riders and they used to communicate with the whales in a certain way i can you damn i can even remember salana hey you nice i even remember the damn sentence man but it's a fun film it's it's and i feel like it's one that people don't remember, don't talk about, and it's just going to be forgotten in the annals of time. But it's worth it. I can't remember the last time. Don't get me wrong. I think they got up to number three. I know I've seen one and I believe I saw two. I know I haven't seen the third. Three Willy Two is all right. It wasn't one, but it was all right. No, 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 no. This is it. Um, It's interesting because you don't actually hear it of it as one of those films but it's really funny in saying that that a lot of our films of that era are very easily they would you know they're golden films but they're they're like hidden gems now it, it's yeah. not been reintroduced to that next generation which is really hard to pill to swallow if I'm honest. well it's a good thing that uh, you've got two cinephiles uh, relaying all this stuff, which I think is a perfect way for you to tangent into uh, into our other show and also to close off Silver Screen News this week, AJ. So guys, look, if anything, what is he talking about? The Silver Screen News have always lived by one motto, and that's we're here to educate and entertain. So what do we do? We edutain you. And this week's episode of the movie Matt Rushmore is an attempt at that on my end anyway, because essentially if you enjoy movies, then you are a cinephile and these are some of the films that you need to watch. So do as well as like, subscribe and share all of these these videos, whether you're watching it in mini segments or all in one, share this, but also tune back in to find out what films a cinephile must have seen. 
it's our personal little checklist to see how in tune you are and how in tune we are. So until the next time, I am the one AJ Anthony Jordan. Yep, that top 10 cinephiles podcast will be airing next Tuesday. So it by the time this airs, it will be the 19th of July. So just a few days to go, guys. Keep it on to the channel. But our top 10 movie dogs podcast that has dropped now. So you can go check that out on the channel too. I'll put that in the link in the description below if you want to check that out. Thank you for watching with us right until the end. We will be back next week with uh, more movie news. My name is Nico Luro, and we will see you guys next week. See ya. Yeah.